mean, we see that in many, many years of Atzlacha and then may all our prayers be accepted So before we even get into any sort of teaching, maybe it's important that we, put, we come together and we speak a little bit about um, the tzaddik of the day. And that is being today, the Ilula, or yesterday, the Ilula, of Rabbi Chaim Pinto Akatan. Now, yesterday we mentioned that Rabbi Chaim Pinto was known to be a man of miracles. A man where literally hundreds of years have passed and still his name stands as being a beacon of hope, a beacon of, of a Yeshua, a beacon of receiving a, something which is above the nature. We're seeing today and we're asking ourselves, what did, what did Sadiqim like Abichai Pinto or other Sadiqim do that gave them so much koach, so much power to truly wield the nature, to truly bend the nature, to truly create miracles that define all laws of logic? What was their secret? What was so special about them? So when we're thinking about this, it brought us a little bit to this week's parasha, and we had a little bit of a machshava before we start our, our limo that on this idea, on this um, concept. In this week's parasha, we see Avraham Avinu Alev Shalom goes through the circumcision, goes through the mila. And we start off with Avraham Avinu Alev Shalom enduring the pain of the third day of the mila. Where there's this teaching, even in Alachot Mila, in Alachot Mila, where even in Alacha it says the third day is the hardest day for health. So, for example, if a boy was uh, his Brit Mila was delayed, so it wasn't on the eighth day; it was pushed to a further day, to a later time. Even Alacha says that if the third day would fall on Shabbat, there's a concept of either doing it later or pushing it off to not have the third day fall on day of Shabbat when it is unnecessary. Being that it's no longer already a chiyuv de oraita, but rather a chiyuv de rabbanan, rather something that could be moved around. So Avraham Avinu is sitting on the third day, he's in great pain. And Avraham Avinu is looking for guests, trying to find someone that he can, some, trying to find someone that he can host, trying to find someone that he can do his, his act of chesed. And we see Akadus Pacho wants to prevent it. What does Hashem do? He pulls out the sun heats up the world, and his plan was, if the world is hot, no one will come out of his home, no one will leave the shade, and no one will be walking in the streets. So, immediately afterwards, we know the story, the angels, etc., etc., I'm not going to get into it. But we're thinking of a question. Hashem wanted to stop Avraham from doing hard work, from Litroach, to put too much effort when he's still healing from, that, from the, the Milam. Mm. He couldn't just cause that no one will walk through that street. He needed to heat up the whole world, global warming, global heating. He needed to take out the sun and cook the world, change the whole mass, change the whole nature. For what? To cause someone to not walk. Make rain, make a stone fall in the, the, the beginning of the, the root. Snow. Snow, something, no, not snow, something more TV, something more natural. And no one walks by Abraham's house, make a smell, something normal. But you heat up the whole globe. What's this idea of changing the entire world for one tzaddik, for one person, for Abraham Avinu Adam So when we're thinking about this idea, it brought us to Adam Marishon. We know that Adam Marishon, the Gemara has a machloket on how big was he. He was not small. We are small, we are tiny. Adam was humongous. There's even a discussion of what was his size. So some say that his height reached to the sky meaning he can take clouds with his hands and when he wanted shade to just put the clouds on his hand. And some say he was so wide that he was able to take his hands and to send them into both directions and make the circle around the world. Hmm. Or in simple words, Adam was humongous. He was huge. It was physically or it was spiritually? That's a big, that's a big, big question. But let's focus on the idea that um, um, he was big. In reality, when we said that he was big, um, especially when Rosho Magyar Shamaima, obviously we're talking about an aspect that he was conscience in the world above. So it's not even necessarily about size here, it's about his head, which is the consciousness. The consciousness is not in the finger and in the heart. The consciousness is in the brain. So the consciousness was above. His feet were in the world, but his, 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 his muhin, his uh, ability to think and process was in the world above. He lived in the world above. So the question is, why did Adam need to be so big? Why couldn't Adam just be a normal size? So Zohar Kadu says, 
It was because Adam, Adam Arishon had a job. And his job was what? His job was to create enough hold, enough power on the world that whatever move he will make, he will pull the world with him. If he will rise to do tshuva and want to come close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he won't just do tshuva on his own, but rather pull the world towards that, towards that Kedusha. And this is a concept that we've explained in many other classes where Hashem structured Adam in a manner that Adam's growth was, would be the result of the growth of the entire world, the entire olam umlo. And that's why the Zohar Kadosh brings this idea of considering a man to be the world. We have this concept that we say, you save one man, you save the whole world. Where did that come from? It comes from the Zohar Kadosh. The Zohar Kadosh says, a man is his own world. And especially in the case of Adam, he was really the size of his own world. He was a world within a world. He was humongous. Especially when we're talking about Adam, where it says that Hashem made every single body part from a different corner of the world, from a different place in the world, to ensure that Adam is truly seen as and perceived as a world. Whenever Adam will walk, will move, will attract himself in a specific direction, he will pull the world with him. We know Adam Maishon failed. He didn't fulfill his task. Instead of bringing the world close, he did it a little bit in the beginning. We said, he brought all the animals. He made the animals sing. It didn't last a long time. He failed at his task. And here we see later on, comes the tzaddik that does the job of the tzaddik, which is repairing not only the sin of Adam, but rather bringing the world back to HaKadosh Baruch which is essentially, like we mentioned, the job of all tzaddikim. And this is referring to Avraham Avinu Allah Bashalom. When we look in the Tehillim, and also in many midrashot, Midrashim, we see that Avraham Avinu Allah Bashalom is not even referred to as Avraham. But rather the Tehillim refers him to Adam. What is Adam? It's the first Adam? No, so this idea was that Avraham truly took on the responsibility of being a world within a world in order to fix the sin of Adam and to pull the world back towards HaKadosh Baruch. And that was Avram's doing. He was the entity that had grasp on the world, that he was the size of the world, that he had reach like a world of his own in order that he will be able to pull the world when he comes towards HaKadosh Baruch. Based off of this idea, we thought of a few concepts. First of all, the power that every individual holds. That with our deeds, we can truly change the world and pull the world towards us, like being that we are small worlds of, our, of ourselves. And second of all, the secret of how tzaddikim are able to cause all ma'aseh bereshit, all the nature, to completely change itself and go towards the tzaddik. Being that what? Being that the tzaddik took the responsibility to fix the entire world, to pull the entire world towards the Baruch Obviously, the world will listen to the desire of the tzaddik. Obviously, the world will obey to the tzaddik, being that the job of the tzaddik is to hold grasp on the entire world, to lead the entire world, to even, you can go as far as saying, to control the entire world. And maybe we could say that's why when Avraham Avin al-Vashalom needed to take some rest, it wasn't the sun that came forth, it wasn't the, a rock that was thrown, it was the entire world changing, being that Avraham Avin al-Vashalom truly held the responsibility of bringing the world close to Hashem. And if that is the case, the world will come towards the tzaddik. And that's this idea of Ritzon Yireav Yaseh. It doesn't say who Yaseh. It just says Ritzon Yireav Yaseh. It says the, the, faith, the desire of those who are faithful, it will listen. Who will listen? Kadosh Baruch Hu we translate to. But we can see even the world, the Teva. All the Beriyot will Yaseh. All the creations will come towards the Tzon Yireav, the desire of those who are faithful, the desire of those who, who, who hold the torch of a true tzaddik. And that maybe, Rabotai, we can apply a little bit of the koach of some tzaddikim who truly succeeded in making the world bend towards them. And we see it's like this, um, a constant uh, reputation between, uh, between Rabbi Chaim Pinto and his grandfather, Rabbi Chaim Pinto, where we see that they had the gift of miracles. They had this extra spark. They had this extra influence. They were able to create change that other tzaddikim, God forbid, each one at his own level, but other tzaddikim that were also huge, didn't have. It comes from an aspect of what? It comes from an aspect of truly wanting 
to bring the world close to HaKadosh Baruch And when the tzaddik has that desire, when the tzaddik takes that responsibility upon himself, the world will come towards him. So first of all, Bezrat Hashem, in the Mirta Tzadik Abichayim Pito, HaKadosh Baruch will spill on all of us, Shefat Bilidai, and may Bezrat Hashem, the world truly come towards us, in order that we will all see within our lives miracles in all the aspects of Enkinyot Tzabat Hashem. So in Abu Tai, today we'd like to talk about something that we mentioned briefly throughout maybe the, the last few months, but we think that it's an extremely important concept that we can learn from this week's Pasha, especially that we are entering into times of great hard work, or you could even say great potential. The time when we all need to act in order to bring upon ourselves Shefa within our life. We explained many times at this point that Abin Nachman says, from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah, the world is judged. But from Chanukah to Chanukah, the year itself begins. Being that if a person prayed for Panasa, for Refua, for Atzlacha on Rosh Hashanah, now it's the time to build the vessel, to build the keli, to do the ne- necessary preparation in order to be able to receive even what was granted to us on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur. So when looking into this parasha, we have to, in all the parashat, we need to really see where we can take some sort of chizuk, where we could learn from how our avot, our forefathers did so, how our forefathers received so much abundance from Hashem in order to imitate them, in order to be inspired, in order to see how we too can bring this presence of HaKadosh Baruch within our own life. So there was one pasuk in this week's pasha that was very, very unique. And it caught our attention. And that's the pasuk that talks about Ishmael. Now, Ishmael, you love him or you hate him, he was successful. Ishmael, as well, Kadosh says, was one of the most powerful, not only nations as a physical nation, but even as an angel. There's a famous Zohar that says that the angel of Ishmael, actually, I don't have to even mention such a sentence, but you would say, corner the Kadosh Baruch Hu. I wouldn't say trick, but corner the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Being that Ishmael was powerful. The Zohar Kadosh says that, uh, just to mention it, because at this point, if we don't mention it, everyone would be uh, curious. It says that um, Ishmael came to uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu, the angel of Ishmael, and he said, you know, someone that does Brit Milah in your name, does he have Chelek in the Shekhinah? So Hashem said, yes, if you do Brit Milah, and you're doing it L'shem, L'shem Malchut, doing it for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of course you have a part in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's world. So he said, what about my kids? All Ishmael, all the, the Muslims, they do Brit Milah, what about them? And he said Hashem was put in a, in a position where he might now need to accept an entire new nation that didn't necessarily receive the Torah. So Hashem made a deal with him. It's not Shlemut, but there's a little bit of it. There are situations that people do Brit Milah for health reasons. People that are not very religious. Yeah, yeah, right. Or even Gerim. Some parents that are even not Jewish, they do Brit Milah for health reasons. If that person wants to convert, or they want to do an official Brit later on, they don't do, they don't do a... a the full brit, because really the full brit you have to do the no, pshita, to open yeah, it, mitzitza. Yeah. We don't do that. What do we do? We do a dam. We drop one drop of blood with the brachot, with the intentions, and that's it. So it's not necessarily about all the details that we are obligated to do, but it's the idea of taking off the orla, getting rid of what attaches a person to the physical uh, stickiness in this world, and trying to come forward and closer towards the Kadosh Baruch Hu. That's the main idea and the main thought. So in any case, so the Kadosh Baruch told Ishmael, the angel of Ishmael, let's make a deal. You want to be a part of my world? Let's make an arrangement. I'll give you the world down there for 1,500 years. And after 1,500 years, that's it, time is off. But for 1,500 years, you will be the strongest nation. Wow. And he said that the angel Ishmael, of course, he didn't have too much value for, for Olam Abba. He said, I'll take it. I'll take Olam Azeh over Olam Abba. So Ishmael was very successful. He was a true, not only successful man, but even from a spiritual level, he had bracha. He had the help of Hashem with him. And that's what the Pasuk, in this week's parasha, in, in Perik Kaf Kaf Aleph, mentions. It says, Ve'yehi elokim et anar, em ve'yigdal anar b'midbar, ve'yehi rova keshet. What does that mean? The Torah says, this boy Ishmael that was raised in the desert, Hashem was with him. But this boy, he came out to be a professional marksman. Now when we read this Pasuk, a 
question can come to mind. All our forefathers, they were tzaddikim, but they were also warlords. They knew how to fight wars better than, uh, than any country. Avram conquered kings as a single person. Uh, Yaakov, his children, Shimon and Levi, at the age of 12, they destroyed the entire city of Shechem. Our forefathers, throughout all the generations, were extremely powerful men. But still, we don't see that the Torah says Avram was a professional swordsman or a professional um, a marksman. They were seen as tzaddikim, as good people, and all their professions of war were not even mentioned at all. But here we see that Torah takes an entire pasuk to emphasize the atzlacha, the success of Ishmael, in being a good marksman. So the question we had was, what is the point of all this? What's the message that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to send us with, with going as far as saying that Ishmael's gift, Ishmael's success was shooting a bow and arrow. When we were thinking about this, being that we're in the book of Bereshit, it brought us a little bit to back to this concept of our place in the world and us needing to understand how much of a itaron, how much of an advantage we all have. Zohar Kadosh says, as we all know, every single physical creation receives life, koach, energy from above. Where every single entity is reliant on shamayim, is dependent on shamayim to be able for it to wake up, for it to be able to, to breathe, for it to be able to keep its heart beating. Nakhon? With that reliance and with that lack of independence, all the creations have a set path that the creation must walk within. So for example, a lion, a Kadosh Baruch Hu created a lion. He receives his life from above. A Kadosh Baruch Hu tells the lion, you are the king of all, of all animals. Your entity, the way you act, is already pre-written. The lion doesn't have a freedom of choice to decide to become a, a sheep. The lion was born a sheep. He receives life from above, then he must stay in that line, that line of being a lion. Every single creation is attached to Shamayim, receives life in Shamayim, but with that also comes the rules and the, bound, the bounding of every creation to its cube, to its box. And that is essentially how all the creation of all the animals function. Zohar Kadosh says man is a little bit different. In what sense? In the sense that we are reliant on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we live every morning not because we take our heart and we make it beat, but rather because we have life from above. We are attached to receive our energy and our, our koach only mishamayim, to the point where the Gemara says, a person will not have energy to move his finger unless they give him permission from above. Where every single movement of life that we all do, human beings, we are all reliant on getting that energy from Olamot Elulim. The difference between other creations and us, B'nai Adam, that we don't have a set a line of rules that we must follow. HaKadosh Baruch created us like Him, B'Tselem Eloki, creators of our own. So even though we receive our life from Him, we are not forced to act and be in a certain manner. We can lead ourselves in any manner we choose. A person wants to be good, be good. A person wants to be cruel, be cruel. A person wants to be happy, be happy. You don't need to attach yourself. The snake needs to be sly. The wolf needs to be sneaky. Man can lead himself in any manner he wants. He's a creator. He is a king. He's a leader. Lead yourself in the direction. And even though, if it's, even though it might not be the choice of Hashem, Hashem will still give you the life and the energy to fulfill your Ratzon. And that is the biggest gift that HaKadosh Baruch ever brought to the world, which was Chofesh HaBechira, freedom. He gives us the life to sometimes even do the things that He doesn't want us to do. That's, his, that's the, the level of Chesed HaKadosh Baruch gave us, the ability to lead ourselves. But with this gift comes big danger. Why? Comes big danger 
Because on one side we are attached to the, an infinite amount of power and we have the freedom to do what we want with it. And this is this deep teaching that the Zohar Kadosh brings in the multiple places of this concept of siyata dishmaya. And the danger of siyata dishmaya, the danger of help from above. Now, when we hear this concept of help from above, it doesn't seem so bad. Mishamayim, they come, they say, okay, you want to go right, go right. You want to go left, go left. From above they help, from above they do the hard work. It seems perfectly fine. Zakat says the danger of siyatadish may have help from above, that it can, come, it can come at any moment. And when it comes, any action that you will do will be extremely successful. In any direction you are pointed, you will go to the other side of the world, pointed in that direction, pointed to that, to that way. So this has a very positive opportunity and upside where you can get up tomorrow and say, I want to build the greatest place of Torah. If Hashem gives you help, you will succeed. And God forbid, it could be in the situation that you are upset one day and you say, I want to harm that individual and I want to do this and I want to do that. And chas v'shalom, God gives help in that moment and you will succeed. You will be successful to the max of it. And this is an analogy that we can give to truly understand the scope of it. It's like a person that has a field. And this person takes seeds of a jalapeno. He takes these seeds, he puts them in the ground. He waits right now at this period of the year. Winter starts to come, the rain starts to fall. And the, ra- the rain gives life to his crop. And the crop gets full of all the seeds that he planted. It comes a few weeks later. He takes, a few months later, he takes from his fruit, he bites it, he says, Mazin, I wanted something sweet. I want something sweet. I want an apple. Why is it something that is spicy? So, he wanted something that was sweet. Instead of something spicy, you needed to plant it. And if you planted it at that time, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent the rain, when he sent his help to bring that fruition, that ratzon, to a reality, you would have left with something sweet. The bottom line, Abotai, Siyata Dishmaya, it takes any desire and, or any placement in which we are in and it pushes it to its max. It's the help that any action that a person wants to bring to fruition, he has the koach to do so freely. But it can come in the cost of sometimes finding ourselves in places that we don't want to be. He didn't want the jalapeno, he wanted the apple doesn't matter what you wanted, what you put in place in the past. Hashem came forward, pushed life into it, and life allowed it to grow. It's like a boat. A boat, a big, a big boat, people don't have the power to move it forward. How does a boat move forward? You take the sail, you point it, and you wait. And when Hashem sends the wind, the wind comes forward, pushes against the sail, and the sail moves in that direction. Ah, maybe you didn't want to go to that direction. Too late. The sail was pointed. Wherever the sail is pointed at the time when the wind starts to push, that's when everything starts to move. And that, Abotai, is the danger of siyata tishmaya. The danger of help from above. Because a help from above can be the biggest blessing if we are prepared for it. And if we are well positioned, or God forbid, something that we never even intended to find ourselves in. And this is something about that we can see throughout the entire Torah. People that wanted to do good and achieve the world, and people that had a th- negative thought and also destroyed the world. We see this, maybe we can say with Abi Akiva. He was small. He was amaret. He knew nothing. He had a good desire. Hashem gave him help. He ended up with 24,000 students. Beautiful growth. And the same thing we can say about people like Korach. Korach maybe didn't intend to do chas v'shalom, a wrong or God forbid split Am Yisrael. But still, he created a, the biggest machroket that ever lasted. It came from what? It came from a moment of siyata dishmaya. A moment of push from above and regardless of where a person's desires are in the future, where you stood at the time where Hashem sent the bracha, in that direction you will be pushed. In that direction you will move. And this Abotai really gives us so much importance 
of how every single moment of our life is a moment of either great potential or great danger. A lot of times, Rabotai, we think, ah, I'm a good person, but I'm allowed to be upset. Or I'm a good person, but I'm allowed to do things that are maybe not necessarily good. And Hashem sends me to places that are not necessarily positive. We have to understand that we have freedom. We're not just bound to being pulled around from right to left. Yes, a call be the shamayim. But the irat shamayim, the fear of God, the, the, the where a person wants to lead himself, it's completely within our hands. Where we choose to put our ratzon, they will push and they will help. We said maybe we can say that this is also even the idea of Ishmael. Ishmael was a man of bracha. He was the son of Avram. The son of Isha Chesed. He had koach. The Torah says what came out of him? He came out from a marksman. Why would the Torah say so? So said, maybe we can say that in the moments that Ishmael was growing and Hashem was with him and Hashem was giving him siyatad Ishmael, what was he doing? He was using the bow and arrow. So instead of taking his abundance and taking his koach and taking his potential and taking all the blessing that Kadosh Baruch Hu already gave him, already stood with him, it all went towards what? It all went towards being a really good marksman. What came out from him is what he desired to do in that moment. And this Rabotai is something we can even see within this week's Aftarah. We know Rabotai the story of Shunamit and Elisha and Garzi. We'll say it very quickly for everyone to, to understand so we can go through it. There was a lady named Shunamit. She wanted children for many, many years. She had a very, very hard time bringing children. She went to Elisha and Avi, to the prophet Elisha, begged Elisha for a child. Elisha gave her bracha to have a child. A few years passed, she had a child, she was extremely happy. The child was only one, two, three years old. The child got sick and died. So it said that Shunamit came to Elisha. She said, I don't understand Elisha. I prayed for a child, you blessed me for a child, and now it passed away. I would have rather you didn't give me the child. I would rather never had a child, never need to deal with this last vizio. Why would you give me the child if he would be taken after immediately? So Elisha, he sat down, he said, you know, he's right. So he called Gahzi, his helper, took a stick, wrote Shem Membet, it's the name of Anna Bekoach, the, the, the name of Hashem with 42 letters, took the stick, gave it to Gahzi, told Gahzi, go to the house of Shunamit, find the child and hit him. When you will hit him with the stick, life will be drawn back into him and he will be alive. Gahzi said, this is very ambitious, but Elisha and Avi asked, I will do it. So he tried to travel. And on the way he was having doubts. He said, I, I'm going to make a fool out of myself. I'm going to start hitting a body. What if he doesn't wake up? It's going to look silly on my end. And while he was traveling, he found the body of a dead dog on the side of the road. So he said, if, if the stick will bring back the child, it could bring back the dog. It's the same life, it's life, it's fine. So he took the stick and he said, let me try. Hit the dog. To his surprise, the dog opened his eyes, gets up and starts to run. So Gahazi was happy. He said, the stick works. Went to the child, he had excitement. He took the stick, started hitting the child. Wallo, like we say in Arabic. The child is, he's not alive. So Gahazi said, it worked a minute ago. It worked perfectly. I'm telling you, it's not a... It's, this is not uh, something that I heard. It worked. And as much as he hit the child with the stick, nothing happened. He returned back to Elisha. He said, Elisha, the stick doesn't work. Elisha says, impossible. Impossible. The stick works. He said, Elisha, it doesn't work. I'm telling you, I hit the kid a hundred times. No matter how much I hit him, they're going to think I, I killed him. Exact opposite. Elisha said, what did you do with the stick? So he said, on the way I saw a dog and I hit him. So Arizal says, but Elisha looked at Gahdi and said, what did you do? I gave you help from above to bring up something back to life. You took that help and you brought a dog back to life? You put all that abundance within a dog? All that bracha, that miracle was directed, was channeled into an animal? So Gahdi said, I didn't know. So to a certain extent, Arizal goes into depth with this teaching of help from above. Siyatad Ishmael is a gift. It's the biggest gift that exists. And it's the gift that can truly change our life for the good. 
or chas v'sham for the bad, in the moment, in the split of a second. And that's why Rabotai, Chazal, give us so much warnings of this idea of being careful of help from above. And this is this idea that in the Gemara, in multiple places, it says, mm-hmm. In the path that the person wants to go, they walk him. Or or they help him, or they push him. What is this idea of in the path that the person wants to go, they push him? In the path that the person wants to go, they uh, make sure that he exceeds in that? So we found another teaching in the Zohar Kadosh, this week's parasha, that is simply incredible. Which also has to do with Ishmael, so it really ties it all together in a, in a seamless manner. It says that when Ishmael was a child, the angels came to Akadosh Baruch Hu, and they said, this child is going to cause so much destruction when he grows up. Instead of saving Ishmael, kill him now. Stop his life immediately. All the suffering that will come in the future will all end. Kadosh Baruch looked at the angels and told them what? Judge him Ba'asher Hu Sham. Judge him where he is right now. Why are you looking in the future? And this Pasuk always amazed us of what is this concept of the angels trying to fight and trying to put on a future that doesn't exist yet on a child? It's a little bit cruel, or you could even go as far as saying um, going against freedom of choice. How can you put a future upon a child? So there's a beautiful deep teaching that talks about this concept of the primiut and the chutzuniut of the world. So, Yesterday we gave a class about chesed and gvura. Kindness and judgment. Chesed and gvura. The right and the left. Zohar Kadosh said that the right and the left, chesed and gvura, also hold two different places within the guf of the Adam. In what way? Chitzoniut. Outside is gvura. And pnimiut. Inside is chesed. How can we get an analogy to truly wrap our minds around this? So it's like a child that goes into a glass store. And this glass store has two partners. One partner very kind, one partner very mean. The child walks in, trips, falls, breaks the entire store. The partner that is kind will look at the child and say, what? Miskin, he tripped, he fell. He had no intentions to cause any harm. Go, you are free, don't worry. The tough one will come and say, I don't care what you thought, what you meant, what you didn't want to do, what you wanted to do. In reality, the cups are broken. Pay for it. The parents must pay. What's the difference between them? The difference between them is that the kind one looks from within, pnimiut, the desire, the, the thought that went behind breaking the cups, which was not a bad one. And the gvura looks from without, looks on the outer layer. And on the outer layer, the cups are broken, so it doesn't matter what made you break them, they're broken, pay for it. And this concept also goes for the entire world, all the worlds, and all the creation within the worlds. We know that there's a famous Torah that says that, Lo yireni adam et panai v'chai. That no man was able to see the insides of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the primiut of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why the insides? So, when you want to see a person's Thoughts that function within his heart. Where do you look? Where do you look? Eyes. You look in the eyes. You look in the face. But aren't we trying to see what's going through his heart? What's in his heart? Why are you looking at his face? Because, Arizal says, Panim, face in Hebrew, is the exact same letters of what? Of Pnimiut. It's the same word. Where if you want to know the Pnimiut of an individual, look at his Panim. Torah says, no man can look in the face of Hashem and live, being that you can't understand the consciousness of Hashem. And that's a whole teaching of its own, a whole class of its own, of uh, the prohibition of trying to understand the primiut, the consciousness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But there was one man that got very close. And that was who? Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu alav shalom was shown what? The achorin, the back. What was this back? What was this prophecy of the back of the uh, of, uh, Akadosh Baruch Hu? Zohar Akadosh is very simple. And this is actually a prophecy that didn't just come down from Moshe, a prophecy that came down to Adam, came down to Yaakov, 
came down to few other forefathers that existed, and that is what? We mentioned that the chitzoniut, the outside, represents what? It represents future. And it represents what occurs. Eliminating the reason, the emotion, the desire behind it. What occurred? It broke, it broke. It's good, it's good. What occurred? Zohar says, the neck is a part of the body that holds the entire body together. Whereas we know from the neck starts the spine, the spine holds every single piece intact. Zohar says, the idea of the prophecy of the back of the neck was really looking into what occurs in the world from beginning of time to end of time. Well, that's the spine. It's the beginning, to, then it holds everything together. The prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu was that HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed him the entire world from the beginning of the creation till the time of the Biyat Gula. That's also how Moshe can write the Torah with Avraham and with Yitzchak. How did he know what Avraham did, what Sarah did, what Adam did, what Noach did? When HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed him the past. He showed him the past. He was able to write the Torah. In this prophecy, HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed Moshe Rabbeinu the entire future. The entire future that sits upon what? Upon the chitzoniut, the outer layer. And the outer layer is chesed or gvura? Gvura, nechon? Zohar says, there's another creation that's also gvura, and also is unable to see within a person's desires, but sees the actions. And that is what? An angel. In what sense? In what sense? In the sense that an angel, like every creation, can see what occurs. But the difference is, that angels are not bound to time. So when they look at an individual, they don't see the individual now, but rather they see what? They see the individual forward. Where the angel doesn't see a person at his place, where he is at that moment, but rather the angel's only ability to see an individual, being that he's above time, is to see that person's stance, position within the world, and to see every single action that will follow based off where he's standing. So the angel's perception on the Adam is always what? It's always future-looking, forward-looking. And that's also this idea of the angels fighting against Hashem, saying, Hashem, why are you creating Bnei Adam? Why do you want to create this man? For what? It's a, it's a creation that's going to sin. It's a creation that's going to wrong you. Hashem said, what are you talking about? What sin? What wrong? Adam didn't sin at all. He didn't, we didn't even create him. How can you already look forward and try to, to jump ahead to the future and see what Adam will do and what Adam will not do? Zohar says, it's because the only way the angel sees the individual is where he's standing, but towards the future in that direction. Maybe we can say that is the essence and this idea of so too, the Malachim with Ishmael. Ishmael, in that moment, was a wild boy. That's why Sarah wanted to get rid of him. The angels didn't see a wild boy that didn't sin. The angels saw a wild boy that turned into a wild man, a wild man that turned into a bad man, a bad man that ended up being a sinner. The angels looked forward. The angels' only ability to perceive us is where we're standing, in what direction we are leaning, what direction we are tilting, push it forward. And maybe we could say that's the idea of Bederech Shadam Rotzelilech Molichimato. In the path that a person wants to walk, they walk him. Who walks him? Ah, the angel's ability is to only push you forward in time. The angel judges you 10 steps ahead. The angel is unable to look at you right now. The angel's vision is seeing whatever direction you are standing with a push in that, in that way, in that direction, in that ruach, um, in that energy. Positive one. It judges the individual positively. Negatively, Chazvet Shammat judges the individual negatively. And that's this concept to show us how far it is so important to understand that every action that we do, it has the potential to grow. It has the potential to be seen as something so much bigger. Only if HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us help. And like we mentioned, Rabotai, it's a very good thing. But it's also a, a concept, a structure, that can cause us great harm if we are pointed in the wrong direction. If we are pointed, God forbid, and not necessarily where we want to be, in an intention where we want it to be. And this Sabotai is an explanation that we gave a few years ago 
on this concept where it says in Nedarim that kol ha-koes kilu oved avod azara. Anyone that's upset, it's like he does idol worship. We always said, why are you so dramatic? If a person is upset, he does idol worship. His wife made him upset. His wife made him upset. She did something silly, he's upset now. So now he's an idol worshiper? Why you go so far as calling him an idol worshiper? So he said, maybe we can say, him, what's this idea of being upset? This idea of being upset, like what we even say in English, it's a person that gives his um, self, give his leadership, give his being to something that's not him. We even say in English, you are losing control. You are losing grasp on where you want to lead yourself. That's also this idea of what Avodah Zarah is. Avodah Zarah, in real translation, means other uh, foreign worship. A worshipping, a, a following, which is foreign to the one that you should be walking on normally. That's why we try and say to idol worship, because idols are not a Kaddish Baruch so it's a foreign type of faith. So that's why, we, that we ha- that's why we have that translation. But an actual word for word translation means a foreign worship. Or in other words, a following of something that's not necessarily what's supposed to be. That abuta is exactly what a moment of anger is. A moment of anger is a person that is being led by something that's not him. And God forbid, chas v'shalom, if he will have the help from HaKadosh Baruch Hu in that moment, then Bichlal, he will find himself in a world that he doesn't recognize. It's a foreign world. It's a foreign reality. We see so many people, for one moment of anger, for one thought of anger, they change their life. And they wake up a year later and they see the life that they have. It's not the same life that they were building only a year ago. We have to understand, Rabotai, that we are all like boats of our own. We're all like spears. We're all like arrows. Where we point ourselves... HaKadosh Baruch Hu pushes. And that's our responsibility. To always make sure that we are always pointed in what? We're always pointed in the right direction. Because we don't know when we're going to get the push. We don't know when we're going to get the help. We don't know when HaKadosh Baruch Hu will push us. And this Rabotai goes even further. It goes even to us understanding our own potential. There's a famous story of Baal Shem Tov that really maybe sums up this concept in, a, in an easy manner we can digest. It says that one time Baal Shem Tov was traveling and there was a very, very famous uh, rider, horse rider, that came to the city. And the Baal Shem Tov saw that all the people of the city were flocking to him. Very famous individual. And Baal Shem Tov stood back and he didn't seem impressed at all. So this horse rider, which was very famous, which was known for winning any race he took upon, sees everyone respecting him except for one old man. So he was very bothered. So he approached Baal Shem Tov. And he said, Baal Shem Tov, I don't understand you. Why are you looking at me with like a lack of respect when everyone knows that I'm the best rider in the world, the best rider in the country? So Baal Shem Tov looked at him and he said, it's, it's because you're a waste of potential. So he said, uh, how is it my waste of potential? I'm the most famous rider in the world. I, am a, I maximize my potential. So said, Basim Tov looked at him and said, no, 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 no. You had the quach to be a king. But you decide to focus on riding horses. So you succeeded like a king that conquers a kingdomship but in riding horses. So we see this concept of Siyatat Ishmael even goes as far as not only pointing ourselves in a positive direction, but making sure that the direction that we do choose is truly a maximizing of our own potential, of our own Yecholet. And Abotai, our Yecholet, our ability, is so much greater than we think. Our power to grow, whether it's spirituality, whether it's panasa, whether it's anything, is so much bigger than what we could imagine. There's a saying that we always say in English. A person is to live his life, not with living up to his potential, but rather making sure that his potential will live up to him.
Sometimes in life we think to ourselves, I can only be this. I can only be that. I can only reach to here. I can only reach to that. We are at its core, building a tiny vessel and saying, Hashem, only fill up this. Nothing more. Give me help just to achieve here. Nothing more. In our core, we're taking maybe bracha that Hashem gave us to be something much bigger and completely turning it into a useless direction, something that won't, really, won't truly make any effect neither on ourselves, neither around the world. We need to understand that before every masim, before any action that is done, the most important, the beginning of all, the root of all, the most powerful thing of change, the most powerful force of change is not even action itself, but rather what? Rather the ratzon, the desire of where we want to be. And as long as our desire is always pointed in a positive way, in a path of growth, in growth that has potential of even further growth, we will always be ready and be properly positioned for when the rain will come when the shefa and the abundance from the sky will drop onto us and fill our fields and fill our homes, what will grow will truly be fruits that will sustain us and give us simcha and yeshua in all manners, physical and spiritual. So Bezrat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch will give us the power to not waste any potential, but more importantly, to always be pointed in the right direction that when the wind comes, we will always be much further in better places. Amen. Amen. Is there any questions, Rabotai? Amen. 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 Yeah, so, um, you said a, a beautiful point that a person should <coughs> have great aspirations and shoot for the stars. But when when does it come to Hashalom that almost he's uh, a person trying to reach something he can't really grab? So, we think, Tzadik, that first of all, Desiring big, regardless of what you will receive, is important. Because it's like an arrow. <clears throat> an arrow, if you shoot it pointed downward, it's going to go, go far, but it's going to fall. The higher you, you aim your arrow, the further you will go. This is a general concept. So in life, we have to first of all understand that it is in our own benefit to always try to achieve the greatest of the greatest. There's even a teaching that Rabbi Nachman says. He says, I can be bigger than Moshe. Now think about even just saying that sentence. Isn't it chutzpah? I can be bigger than Moshe. It sounds not only disrespectful, but it sounds ridiculous. You can go and climb to the sky. Rabbi Nachman says, yes. The mistake is that we don't think that we can be bigger than Moshe. But if we all thought we can be bigger than Moshe, then I am sure more Moshe's would have been. So obviously we need to try to always achieve the most. Now, what's important that we know that we strive to run after not only what we want, and this is something that we, are, we push to the young all the time, but something that they need. And you'll find that your needs will always be brought to you. And if we're able to chase after we need in our life, we'll find that we'll gather much more than what we would ever have wanted. And that's actually a big, big machshava and itbodedut and cheshbon uh, nefesh, a lot of thought that a person needs to have with himself and really deciding in what direction he wants to go because this is the direction that he needs. And all the young do this mistake with regards to panasa and work and where they say, first, I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to do this. And usually wanting is short term. Needing is long term. You need to get married because you're going to get old. You want to have fun because you are silly and bored. So need usually tends to be a longer format of desire. And uh, wanting usually tends to be short term. The goal is really finding on each individual what he needs to be his best version. <coughs> if we strive to reach to the biggest excesses of what we need because that benefits us as individuals, each one is different, then there's no wrong of shooting for the sky. There is no wrong in it. Now there are some people that are built for different, uh, different things. There's a teaching that uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the writer of uh, Shulchan Aruch, he wanted to learn Kabbalah. He was stubborn on wanting to learn Kabbalah. It even goes as far as saying that him and Arizal would pray together. So 
he would sit with Arizal and try to study with Marizal. And he said that no matter what he studied, he couldn't understand it. Now, whoever studies Bet Yosef knows that he was a genius. So there wasn't a problem of capacity in his brain. He was very smart. But clearly there was a, a different path that he needed to walk in. So this is also not something that contradicts, but another thing to keep in mind that we do have in general um, um, tikkuns, missions. What's chokhmah, what's real uh, knowledge is finding what we need and what we want within our mission. So, if we find what we want, what we need, what we need, and we reach the skies, only good will come from it. Any, any other questions? Can Sadiq? Isn't it we, we, we ask Hashem for Him to decide what good for us every day, mm -hmm. for Him to put us in that pack, mm -hmm. or, or we should have a desire ourselves to make that pack? So it's both, both that Abi David mentioned. It's first of all asking for my Kaddish Baruch give us what we need and what is good for us. But also, we need to understand that we do have the kwaq, the power to even change our own mazal. We're not animals. We're not born in one way and we're stuck in that way. A person can change his path a thousand times. There's even to this point where it says that a person can change his zivug. That's how far you can change the other half that you were born with. That's how far you can alter your past. You can alter your nishnama that came down to the world with you. So, yes, we must pray for Hashem to give us what would be good for us, what would be our, um, what will work towards our benefit. But it doesn't mean that we, ha that, that we don't have the koach to change our mazal, to change where we are supposed to st stand, to even go as far as saying changing our mission. Still, we can pray for that. But we can pray for it. We gave a class a year ago about this idea of whether or not we're even allowed to ask from Hashem, in that case, to stop a punishment. A person is sick. Ah, can you pray for healing? Why would you, allow, why would you be allowed to pray for, pray for healing? Didn't Hashem want him to be healing? Didn't Hashem want him to be sick, Mechila? So if you want him to be sick, you're praying for his healing, you're trying to change the desire of Hashem. It, it goes against logic. How can you say such a thing? How can you ask from Hashem to stop his desire? So sometimes he wants that also. It's said that we could change it. Look at our ancestors. Sarah was born Akara. It's not that she was born Akara with a plan that Hashem will make her. Every woman is born Akara. Every woman is born unable to bring children because she's a child. And every man is born unable to bring children. And then he grows up and then he becomes able. It wasn't like that with Sarah. She was literally born without a womb. And that was supposed to be her end plan. Yes. She changed it. She was able to push forward. She was able to ask for more. So it is both. One, asking for what will be good for us. And the second, understanding that we could change. We can change our fate. We can change our future. We can change our mazal. We can change what we think is permanent. We can change everything. Changing. Uh, last night you were talking about Chesed and Gevura. But if someone has that Chesed more in him and he knows he's not balanced, he cannot say no. He cannot, when he has to stop. That is a big problem. A big, big problem. There's a few uh, students of ours um, that they run a big, uh, big companies with a lot of people. And in the beginning, they would call us and say, Rav, you know, there's this individual that's He's in need, and he's in this, and he's in that, and I have to hire him. And to their surprise, we said under no circumstances. Now what, what good does it do to us for him to not hire someone that's in need? And the answer is very simple. Zohar Kadu says, we must be smart enough to understand that there are places that we need to act bigvura, to act with uh, strength, and places we must act with chesed. If you mix them in the wrong places, you end up creating complete destruction. To the point where it says that a person can lose his parnasa, 
lose his panasa for acting with, in chesed within his work. In his work. Our grandfather would say, Sha'at achila, sha'at milchama. The hour of when you work to achieve your food, it's an hour of war. There's even this idea of Issachar and Zivulun. Issachar sits and studies, Nachon? Zivulun goes and, st- uh, 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 goes and works. What's Zivulun? Klizain. The word Zivulun means Klizain. What's Klizain? A, a, a vessel of war. Meaning, work is war. So what do we tell those people? You want to give them panasa? Give them panasa out of your work. Out of your work. You're doing chesed. Give them staka. It's not, n- not work. You can't mix things. You can't. There's a balance in life. But there are places that must have a majority of each, each or or. And that really comes with a lot of chokhmah and, uh, and needing to wield both. And that was Avram. Avram knew it to be so kind. He had such kindness on the sheep. He was feeding the sheep and taking care of the sheep. He found Marat HaMechpah because he was chasing a baby sheep to feed it. Kind. But when he needed to do shechita to his son, he didn't think. So we need to find the balance and we have to understand where we must act in din and where we must act in chesed. And as long as we can keep um, those things separated and live a life full of both, of that balance, we will be able to be kept for a long, we'll be able to, to, like we mentioned yesterday, to preserve ourselves. A company, which is a job that a person wants to do chesed, he will not preserve his company, his company will rot. Is to put salt, like we mentioned yesterday, yes. which is burns, but it will keep everything fresh. So we have to know when to separate. We have to. And it's hard. We're not saying that it's, that it's easy. But there are moments in time. Shalom Bait, obviously, is the place of chesed. Obviously. Also with Shalom Bait, we have to be honest with ourselves that Hashem created that balance already. The man's supposed to act in chesed and the woman's supposed to act in gvura. So she's supposed to make you upset and you're supposed to smile and accept it. That's, 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 that was always the balance that it was supposed to be. The balance was always that you need, even within a person's marriage, to have chesed and gvura. You need it. Physically, like we mentioned yesterday to the tzaddikah that asked, physically there is a balance. One is a giver, one is a receiver. One has a place to hold tight what was received, and one has the ability to give endlessly. So, it's, it's a structure. And really, in reality, it's a structure to the entire world. We're telling Gabi Aaron, where is he? Gabi Aaron, uh, on the way, that last night, we didn't want to give the class about Chesed and Gura. We wanted to give a different class. And the reason that we, we didn't want to give a class about Chesed and Gura, because we said Chesed, Gura, it's repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. Okay, you have to have a balance stuff. Uh, it sounds like a person of a diet more than a class. Uh, to have balance and ma lo shayach. It's not. What's the application? And then in the last moment we said, but this is really life. Our whole world is structured off of it. So even though it's maybe something that is um, a repeating subject. It's repeating because it's very important. And it repeats itself because it's really the foundation. So because it's the foundation, it's extremely important to really master at it. Master at it. And if we master at that, we live long life. We are preserved. Master at what? Balance? Chesed and Gvura. Balance. Chesed and Gvura. I was in there yesterday. Yeah. Balancing Chesed and balancing Gvura. I see, I see. And when there's a balance, there is good and there is bad. There is harsh and there is sweetness. When there is no balance, it's chaos. And, and, and women is a vessel and men are givers. givers. Mm-hmm. Now, now, also yesterday we talked about you gotta create your vessel. You gotta you gotta make your vessel ready to, to when Hashem wants to give you, you can accept the gift of Hashem. But men don't have the source. That they, that means your 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 wife, what you're creating, what you're making, what you're working on is if it's your other half, your wife, that's your vessel? First of all we know that marriage brings panasa. 
So there is a, a clear connection that when a person gets married, he's he, he building a, a, a vessel like we, like we just mentioned to receive abundance and to receive bracha and to receive panasam. But we really think that also the wife is really the vessel of life itself. In the sense that what? It says in the Gemara that a person that is not married is considered to be dead. That's what it says. He's, he's a dead person. He's not alive. Once he's married, he's considered to be alive. Only once he's married. So we see this concept that the vessel truly creates, not only like we mentioned, uh, preserves life, makes life continue on, but it also creates a keli for life to be. Now that can be spiritually, where the wife's job is to create the home, or what's the home? It's the vessel in which you bring your kedusha and your bracha and your abundance comes to your home. So it's again creating a vessel, creating a bait. It's from the aspect of children, it's the aspect of panasa, to a certain extent. It's even out of the aspect of your own uh, growth. Your own growth comes with, within the help of, of a person's eshet chayil, a person's wife. So a person needs to understand that him and his wife, they're meant to be like one and they're meant to balance each other out the same way Avraham and Yitzchak needed to be connected in order to balance each other out to have Yaakov, to have an everlasting, an everlasting line. So that, that balance is, um, is, I would even say, extremely profound with, with regards to Shalom Bayit and peace in the home. And, um, now with the question is, the man by their own, they don't have vessel. No. That's the, no. Yeah. A man, you leave him a man alone in Ireland, he dies. Humanity stops. Everything ends. He comes to a place of, uh, of nothingness. You know what a strong man is? A strong man that's fighting for his family at home. So we see that at every level, the wife, it gives the man purpose, fight, energy, life, continuation, uh, merit, warmth. It's everything. It's truly everything. To the point where we are, we are patur, we are chum patur. Yeah. Exempted from studying Torah in many cases when it comes up to needing to go get married. Yeah. They say, sit down, don't go study, go get married. There are times when you need to. I think that's something that is uh, very, very, very important. Ken Sadika. Happy with that. You have to listen to some music and calm down <laughs> and realize that life is much more beautiful and uh, everything will come to you. The bottom line is our world is always moving. Hashem is always bringing another opportunity. Hashem is constantly cheering us to want to grow and to reach to higher levels. So I don't think uh, if a person thinks that of himself that he is stuck, I don't think that's the reality. I think, like I mentioned, he needs to maybe have a drink, have music, and he will be fine. He will know that, he will understand what he needs to do to start moving forward. The fact that a person is thinking that he is stuck, is a, that's the problem. That's the problem. Now, certain situations, we hit walls, we have tests. Besides, the tests and stuck are different. Stuck is applying that nothing is happening. A test is implying that something is happening, overcome it, and you'll move to the next chapter. So the idea of stuck is really Satan. It's really Satan. It's the fear that the Satan puts within us to freeze. And when we freeze, we don't end up doing anything. Kin Sadika. Us, 
So desire, we have two desires. We say, We have two hearts. That's what we say in Shema. Levavicha, plural. Why two? Because we have Yetzeratov, the Neshama, that pulls us towards spirituality. And we have Yetzerara, which is like our body, that pulls us towards our material desires and needs. So what pulls us in directions of leadership is really the mixture of both. If we had only body, we can't be punished, there's no desire, we lose our freedom. If we have only nishama, we lose our freedom. So the, the pull of both, what gives us this ability of, uh, to desire. And we also have something that's above words, which is the ability and desire to create. Now at the root of what create means, it means make something that doesn't exist. So that's really the, our most profound trait that Hashem installed within us. The desire to create, the desire to make, the desire to invent, the desire to um, always want to see change and in, uh, in progress within the world. So, Can you have a world of desire and not the vessel? Bevadai, bevadai. But we also think that the, the desire is also to a certain extent what creates the vessel. I tell people, young people especially, that their most important thing that they must nail is knowing what they want, knowing what they need, like I mentioned before. Because the desire is half the job. Let me give you an example. We come to Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi, where are you right now? You are in? Tarzana. Tarzana. Go to San Diego. You want to go to San Diego, right? So, Abu Yudha will check his phone. Know that the drive is two hours, right? Two hours. And depending on how much he wants to go, he will decide if two hours is a worthy of price. And he will pay the price and drive if he wants to. Or if he doesn't, he won't. It's fairly simple. Where he is, where he wants to be. Simple calculation, yes, no, yes, good, no, nothing. But what if I come to Abidin and say, Abidin, go. Where? Go, go, go. You want to be somewhere. Where is this place? Just drive, go. Will Abidin go? He will say, go where? I'm not going to go in my car and start driving around. It becomes like a, a much bigger hurdle. It becomes like a fight that is exhausting, a, a task which is exhausting, something that we don't see necessarily hope to it, a light. And it's simply because we're not, we don't have a destination. There's no, there's no goal. So knowing what we want is very important. And desiring is very important. If you don't desire, you don't have a vessel. Machshava, dibur, maase. Starts off with machshava, desire. Then it can turn into dibur, a deeper form of existence, a further form of existence. But now people can see it and hear it. And then it can turn into a reality. But it starts with machshava. Sometimes you have, you know, you have a desire. Obviously, you have a desire to, you know, be successful or something with a new company. Sometimes um, during the day, there's incidents or occasions that you don't realize what Hashem is trying to tell you. But when you're a day after, in, when you're quiet or you're doing something that you're not even thinking, the idea just flushes into your into your mind. Is that? So that's sort of what we said last night. We said, uh, did we mention this in the end about the laugh? Yes. So we said last night that Yitzchak is laughter. What's Yitzchak? Why laughter? So it said that Sarah laughed. Why did Sarah laugh? So the way that we tra- explained it was Sarah asked for a child. Hashem said no. She asked for a child again. Hashem said no. She had to push. It was a big test to get a child. When Hashem told her, you know what, fine, I'll give you a child, she started to laugh. Why? So he said that um, test, gvura, they're bitter while they're happening. But that bitterness, because it's a test, it's a constraint, it's a limit, it's a border. Later on, we realized that, that border, that constraint was always only a preparation to receive. So when you look back, what do you do? You laugh. You say, that was so silly. That was so funny. That's why it says that the, the forefather that will lead the Giula will be Itzchak. 
Yitzchak will come forward and he will, he will be the, the cleanser of the world. That's why we find a few, two places in the Tehillim. It says Yitzchak with a shin. Yitzchak. Why the shin? Because the shin, the Zohar says, is the loudest letter in the alphabet. So when you want to make someone quiet, what do you do? Shh. So it's the loudest letter. It overrules any other noise. So if there's people talking, shh, and you're guaranteed that yours will overrule. What's the shin? Shin represents ish. Fire too is the most powerful entity in the world. So it's Yitzchak, which is power, fire, heat, burning. He will bring the Geula. He will cause that through his fire, he will clean the world. And that's the idea of the most powerful, which is the Shin. So this idea of Geula, this idea of redemption, will be with what? With big laughter. Where it even goes as far as the Midrash saying, when we will all wake up for Tchat Ametim, the resurrection, as he malet Tchok Pinu. We will all start to laugh. Why? I said that when the Geula will come, everything will be funny to us. Where the grandfather will wake up, a young man, and the grandson will wake up an old man. And the 20-year-old grandfather will look at the 90-year-old grandson and say, you are a Saba? And he will say, yes, I am your Saba. And they're going to laugh at one another. And it says that the world will be full of laughter. Because everyone will look at this world and say, all our challenges were such stuyot. All those hardships were useless. They were worthless. They had no effect. They had no... They had no uh, last, uh, le, 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 lasting. meaning, lasting effect. We will all just laugh. So really when there's a test that we look back and we laugh to, it's really just a test for bracha. That's why most people that get married, they're good couples. They'll say the story, you know, how I found my husband and how I found my wife. And, then, and they're excited to say the story of how they're suffering. It sounds a little bit like a masochist. You look back and you're saying the st- how, or people that were very poor, they say, I started with one dollar in my... Shh, shh. But it's bad. Why are you talking about it? No, no, no. Afterwards, it becomes... This, this, is what, this is what made me. This is what made me. So it's the gvura, that uh, test throughout the day that prepares the bracha to come later. It's last night's class. Chaval, chaval, chaval. You, you were here? You, you arrived when? I, on Monday, but, but 